You're at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. I'm John Cook, professor and chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist Research Institute. And uh, today we're going to be hearing about a novel concept in cardiovascular disease, and that is disturbances of proteostasis, of uh, protein metabolism. You're going to be hearing about our, from our guest tonight. And here to introduce him is Dr. Lee Lai. Dr. Lee Lai is an assistant professor here in the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences, and she'll be introducing our guest speaker. Yes. Um, Dr. Christopher Glambowski is a renowned researcher in cardiovascular disease with a remarkable background and a wide range of accomplishment as a scientist as well as an educator and a leader. He is the inaugural director of Translational Cardiovascular Research Center, the Associate Dean for Research, and a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine in the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Dr. Dr. Glambowski earned a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from California Polytechnic State University at San Luis Obispo, and a doctoral doctor uh, in biochemistry from University of California, Los Angeles. He continues his studies at University of Colorado Health Science Center in Denver as postdoc in molecular physiology and moved to his first faculty position as professor of pharmacology at the School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia before relocating to San Diego to become director of the San Diego State University Heart Institute. His research centers around the area of molecular cardiology with a focus on identifying new therapeutics for treating ischemic and hypertrophic cardiobiopsies. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome, Professor Glabowski. It's a pleasure to see you today, and uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, your work on uh, proteostasis and uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, tell us, uh, before we start though, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your daily your daily uh, work. Uh, what, what's uh, that like? Tell us a little bit about uh, what your work at the translational uh, division there. We're having a little, tr little trouble with the audio. Sorry. This should be better. There we go. <laughs> the, mute, the mute button is always a problem. So. <laughs> so, so the question was, tell us a little bit about your daily life at the uh, Translational Cardiovascular Science Center that you're directing. Yeah, so uh, I am really excited to be here because uh, I, I think you might be muted just in case. I'm the inaugural director of the center, and um, I, uh, um, in that role, I get to. Uh, hire many new faculty and forge many new collaborations between the faculty who are already here uh, in uh, basic science research as well as uh, clinical research. So one of my main efforts has been, uh, as the name of the position uh, states, to forge better collaborative agreements between science researchers and clinical researchers. Uh, and we've done just that. We've already uh, gotten funding in our first couple of years here uh, to initiate such programs. And uh, I think it's been quite successful. So what do I do every day? I uh, get on Zoom and have lots of meetings with people uh, close and far and uh, try to uh, bring together uh, people with uh, different interests in cardiology and cardiovascular science uh, to do uh, productive research together. One of the interesting things about my job here at the University of Arizona is that I'm in Phoenix where uh, most uh, of the people uh, who live in Arizona live. It's the fifth largest city in the US. And so there is a high demand for healthcare needs here. Uh, and of course my area is cardiovascular. So we have a variety of partner hospitals in the area that we work with uh, ranging all the way from Phoenix Children's Hospital to our Phoenix VA healthcare system to the Banner University Medical Center. Uh, and those are all within one or two miles of our labs here. So um, between that and writing papers and writing and reviewing grants, that's, that's how I like to spend my days. Tip from you, I, I'm, I'm in a similar role here trying to get the clinicians and the basic scientists to, to work more closely together. 
And it's difficult sometimes, isn't it? Because the clinicians are so busy, they uh, have uh, very long hours. Um, how do you uh, incentivize or how do you promote that kind of interaction between the basic scientists and the clinicians? So um, going back to one of your points about the busy clinicians, uh, I think everybody's busy doing their own thing. And uh, this is the challenge, is getting people who are, are really holed up in their own world uh, to, to get up for a moment and look outside uh, their, their box, as it were, uh, and see uh, what else is available around them. So one of the things we do here is uh, we have uh, lots of uh, interdisciplinary translational research seminars at Grand Rounds, as many mm -hmm. as we can, that foster translational research. And then periodic meetings where we specifically invite uh, people from both sides of that fence that you just mentioned uh, to come together in a pretty small venue, uh, which offers an opportunity uh, for real-time exchange of ideas and and uh, kind of give little brief talks on either the uh, clinical pursuits they're interested in or the scientific pursuits of interest. Uh, what I really think is involved is uh, getting people to think a little bit like their counterpart or to realize what the counterpart uh, is mm -hmm. up against, as it were, in terms of their daily activities. Mm -hmm. So in my view, the physician's world is one of very uh, busy, uh, quick decision-making kind of settings usually, mm -hmm. and not a lot of time to think very deeply about scientific or clinical practice problems in ways that uh, look towards solving uh, problems, those problems in the future. Uh, so really, I think uh, allowing people enough time to get together and stop and think uh, about how to collaborate is is one of the ways that I've found success in this area. Yeah. Well, you have been successful, and I look forward now to hearing a little bit more about the latest from your group. Uh, before we do embark on that, I'd just like to remind our listeners that they can join by text with questions uh, to Professor Glombotsky uh, by texting DeBakey uh, at 37607. So call 37607 and text DeBakey. Uh, and then text your message or your question. Or you can join by web. You can go to pollev.com and enter DeBakey and respond to that activity. So please uh, send us your questions, and um, uh, Dr. Lai will read those questions uh, to Dr. Gumbatsky. So let's hear more about proteostasis and cardiovascular disease. Okay, I'm going to share my screen soon, but I want to take a moment before we get uh, too deep into the topic. Uh, to, to thank you, Dr. Cook, for uh, the wonderful invitation uh, to be on this webinar. Uh, it's, it's great to meet with you and your colleagues, uh, and to thank you also for the great um, introduction. So uh, thank you for that, and I'll just go ahead and share screen. So maybe this is going to be something a little new and different for everybody. Um, and this is a new uh, topic that we're actually just working on right now. And the uh, slideshow uh, may be a little rough around the edges, but um, I, I hope I'm able to get to you, uh, across to you the content um, that is uh, interesting that I think uh, interesting that we're working on now. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully uh, start with the right. Pick the right. Okay. Can everybody see my first slide? Yes. I think so. It's we good can. there. Okay. So uh, I'm going to try and find where the pointer is. Well, I'll just use this arrow. I think everybody can see the arrow. So I'm going to talk to you today about proteostasis and cardiovascular disease. And uh, I give you a little bit of historical perspective to start, but where this is going to is uh, new uh, directions, new understanding of uh, the biochemical and signaling pathways in the heart that could serve as potentially new therapeutic targets for treating a variety of heart diseases. 
And um, our research uh, attacks this proteostasis problem uh, with the translation in mind to uh, develop either small molecule drugs or drug candidates that would affect proteostasis in a productive manner or gene therapies uh, or a combination of the both. And today I think uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit about the combination of the both. So I uh, wanted to remind you uh, what is proteostasis uh, is diagrammed nicely in this um, cartoon here that really talks about the lifestyle of proteins in every cell. Our focus has been the heart and mostly cardiac myocytes, but not exclusively. We also interested in non-myocytes like stem cells and fibroblasts, but today's talk is gonna be mostly focused around cardiac myocytes, where of course we all know that amino acids get converted into polypeptides. And the important thing is they have to fold properly and obtain, um, attain a 3D uh, sometimes quaternary structure before they're actually functional. Uh, and it's easy for people to draw this folding process, but it's hard for proteins to do the folding process. And uh, they, they, they uh, go through kind of a trial and error in that folding, uh, depending on the protein as to how long they try and how many errors are involved before they actually reach uh, the steady state uh, area where they are um, in their active configuration. And then when proteins are, are finished, their lifetime is over, then they have to get degraded. And there's a couple of ways for that degradation to take place. Today, we're gonna to talk mostly about the ubiquitin proteasome system, the UPS, but autophagy is another way that proteins can also be degraded. So if you think about it, uh, proteins have a lifetime in, uh, in cells, and there's various reasons why that lifetime has limitations. And there's various ways that cells have of identifying when a protein's lifetime is uh, complete and ready for degradation into peptides and amino acids so we can start the cycle all over again. So maintaining this balance for healthy uh, cell function is what proteostasis really is all about. And we entered this field uh, too long ago than I can really uh, uh, admit here, thinking uh, that not a lot had been done on proteostasis as a possible target for new therapies for heart disease at the time that we started. And so we thought it was fertile ground for uh, maybe understanding better about how cardiac myocytes in the heart works in this regard in the disease state. So it's about the life cycle of proteins, balancing that life cycle and maintaining the proteome integrity, kind of like key words that we think about uh, that describe proteostasis in the heart. So when we started on proteostasis, we were focused on the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's pretty much where I'm gonna stay focused for today. Uh, and there's specific reasons we were focused on the ER, and that's because in all cells, the ER is a, a real uh, important factory for protein synthesis. And I'm gonna name some of the proteins that are synthesized in the ER of cardiac myocytes for you in a moment. But just to remind you um, that the ER, uh, when proteins are made in the ER, they uh, ribosomes live outside the ER. So for those proteins to get inside the ER to become luminal proteins or as uh, membrane proteins in the ER, uh, they have to be co-translationally translocated across the ER membrane and then packaged into the Golgi and then either secreted if they're a secreted protein or integrated into say cell surface membranes if they're receptors or other membrane proteins. Uh, so important thing to remember, ER proteins um, get there by this translocation process uh, that takes them across the ER membrane. So why should we worry about ER proteins and proteostasis in the heart? It's because those proteins are critical for the synthesis, well, the ER is critical for the synthesis and folding of many proteins in cardiac myocytes. And I list a couple of main categories here that I'm sure you all think about every day, but maybe don't think about how they get made, such as secreted peptide hormones, growth factors, cell surface receptors, contractile calcium handling proteins, and stem cell protein uh, homing factors. These are all examples of proteins that get made in the ER of cardiac myocytes. When it comes to cardiac myocytes, most people think about the ER in terms of uh, 
calcium uh, handling for contraction. But we think of the ER for other things. And the story I want to talk to you today about is called ER associated protein degradation or ERAD is the abbreviation uh, in the heart. And nobody had uh, studied this at the time we started on this in, um, oh, about uh, 2012 or 13. Uh, and uh, so here is the basic schema of how this ERAD works. And this had been studied in many cell model systems and tumor cells in culture, but never studied in the heart, certainly not in cardiac myocytes before. So we start with the uh, diagram here that shows here is the lumen of the ER inside the ER. And here's the cytosol outside the ER. And what we worry about is when proteins become misfolded, it could be due to a stress that changes the ER environment, could be due to many other things. What do we do with those proteins that are potentially toxic to cells? So we have to degrade those proteins and considering the ER uh, structure, we have to get those proteins out of the ER because there's no protein degradation machinery inside the ER. And then those proteins that are misfolded, uh, shown as this kind of funny looking circle, uh, get ubiquitinated. And we found an important uh, E3 ubiquitin kinase, uh, ligase in the heart is called HERD1, more on that in just a moment. And after ubiquitination, uh, these uh, misfolded proteins get shuttled to proteasomes that live on the cytosolic face of the ER, uh, actually bound to the ER in close association, and then they get degraded. So it's a pretty complex process, and it, it's required that misfolded proteins in the ER get retro-translocated back out of the ER because there's no degradation machinery within the ER. And in this case, we're focusing on the the proteasome, uh, ubiquitin proteasome degradation machinery. So this is what captivated our interest. And what we wondered is uh, we had just shown that uh, in mouse model systems of cardiac pathology, uh, there are many proteins in the ER that become misfolded. And so we wondered whether that was uh, contributing to the pathology phenotype. And if so, whether we could um, elaborate on that misfolding and maybe find a way to repair it or, um, or fortify it. So uh, what we look for a molecular link between HERD1 and heart growth. And I don't have a, a lot of time to get into the reasons why we look for this link, um, but we focused on a, an enzyme a kinase that some of you may have heard of. And it's a cytosolic kinase uh, named SGK1, serum glucocorticoid-induced protein kinase 1. And um, it's a, a member of the AKT family of kinases, but uh, it's, it substrate specificity is somewhat different than AKT. And uh, it had been found to do some interesting things in some other cell types that we thought uh, could serve as a link between HERD1 and heart growth. The reason we were looking for this link is because we found that when we overexpress HERD1 in the heart, the hearts didn't grow as much. And it was hard for us to understand how an E3 ubiquitin ligase could regulate uh, the growth of cardiac myocytes. So I'll tell you why we focused on SGK1. It turned out to be uh, that it's for a long time been known to be involved in cancer growth of uh, the most metastatic cancer cells uh, have high levels of SGK1. As a matter of fact, it's used as a biomarker for cancer um, is just measuring SGK1. Another thing that we found particularly interesting is its role in the kidney and sodium, re, uh, sodium reabsorption. So this role for SGK1 uh, sparked our interest because even though it's a cytosolic protein in the kidney and renal epithelial cells, it had been shown that it has an ER targeting sequence that takes it from the cytoplasm elsewhere and to the ER, the surface of the ER. And when it goes to the ER, it turns out that uh, if there's uh, plenty of sodium reabsorption and aldosterone is low, then it gets degraded at the ER by, hold on, uh, uh, in a HERD1 dependent process. And this is in kidney renal epithelial cells. What had also been shown is 
when you need to increase sodium reabsorption, as we all know, aldosterone goes up, and this also increases the expression of a chaperone called Gil Z, this little moon-shaped uh, object here, which um, cloaks the ER targeting sequence of SGK1, keeps it away from HERD1 so it doesn't get degraded, and, and then SGK1 can go to the plasma membrane and do uh, lots of reactions where it increases the amount of uh, epithelial cell sodium channels, and this increases sodium reabsorption. So that was just a, a little walk down memory lane for uh, cardiac, uh, I mean, for uh, renal uh, epithelial cell physiology. So here was our thought. Uh, so I just wanted to emphasize that this GIL-Z protein is called GIL-Z because it's glucocorticoid-induced leucine zipper. That's what that stands for. And both aldosterone and glucocorticoids induce uh, GIL-Z. So this is what we wondered whether it was going on in the heart is that SGK1 may be a growth stimulus. So when the growth stimulus is low, then SGK1 via this uh, ER targeting sequence goes to the ER, it's ubiquitated by HERD1 and is degraded. So it doesn't participate in cardiac myocyte growth. However, when there's an increase in growth stimulus, you might increase the expression of the chaperone GIL-Z, maybe even SGK1 too, uh, and then it, doesn't go to the ER, doesn't get ubiquitated by HERD1, and now can do what it does in cancer cells and foster cardiac myocyte growth. So that was kind of our hypothesis that we set out to study. And one of the first things we did is just measure the amount of SGK1 and GIL-Z that are expressed in the heart in both the human heart disease as well as in mouse models of heart disease. So what our hypothesis was, is that the cytosolic protein SGK1 co-ops part of the ER associated degradation machinery, it uses the uh, HERD1 um, protein to become ubiquitated and then degraded. So even though it's not an ER protein, never has been in the ER, is not a membranous protein, it uses part of the ER associated protein degradation system as part of the homeostatic balance of how much SGK1 is present. So here's uh, the study I was telling you about where we looked in human heart failure and saw that SGK1 levels, according to immunoblot, were increased here as were GIL-Z levels. And that's shown here, you can see heart failure, SGK1 is much increased as is GIL-Z. Uh, sorry, this is at mRNA levels. Uh, we just have the picture of the immunoblot levels. And with TAC, you can see uh, that's a mouse model of, uh, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that we use. There's an increase in protein expression of GIL-Z as well as SGK1, and the mRNAs go up coordinately in mouse models uh, of heart disease as well. So the first criteria were established. Gil both GIL-Z and SGK1 are upregulated in response to heart disease in uh, our mouse models as well as in uh, human heart failure samples. So we took this further and asked if we knock down SGK1, uh, what effect would that have on heart failure in mice subjected to transaortic constriction? So uh, we used an AAV9 approach and SGK1 flocks mice to deliver CRE to cardiac myocytes and knock down SGK1 specifically in that cell type. So that's shown here. Uh, and when we do knock it down, it turns out that the um, heart failure is much worse uh, after TAC, uh, shown here by increased uh, heart weight to body weight and uh, heart weight to tibia length. Uh, and after four weeks of TAC, you can see that uh, these parameters are, are um, much uh, actually reduced. So it turns out that SGK1 in the heart is responsible for the large growth that you see uh, in these model systems of, of heart disease. So um, we looked at uh, parameters in mice using echocardiography of, uh, of cardiac function. So here you can see when we overexpress SGK1 in the heart, in wild type, ejection fraction goes down. That's wild type SGK1. But if we make a version that's kinase dead, then 
uh, ejection fraction is preserved. The same is true with uh, LV mass, where wild type SGK1 exacerbates uh, the increase in LV mass, whereas uh, if we make a, a AAV overexpressing a kinase inactive version, then we don't see this effect. So SGK1 uh, increases growth of the heart, decreases the uh, ejection fraction and other cardiac uh, functional parameters, uh, and this requires the uh, kinase activity of SGK1 to do that. So uh, we move to cardiac myocytes in culture, uh, and uh, I think uh, the next couple of slides I'm going to show are about um, examining the molecular mechanism of how SGK1 works in this regard. So here I want to show you that in this uh, model of uh, neonatal ventricular myocytes, when we treat with the growth agonist phenylephrine, it mimics TAC in vivo or causes uh, pathological cardiac hypertrophy uh, mimicked in a uh, culture dish. Uh, and so here we show at the uh, cell area level that uh, phenylephrine increases the size of the cells. And at the mRNA level, ANP, a typical marker of heart disease, goes up uh, tremendously in response to phenylephrine. However, when we do this same experiment and knock down SGK1 using siRNA, what we see um, here is that knocking down SGK1 blunts all of the growth effects in the heart and actually decrease the basal uh, effects of uh, uh, just of, in this case, uh, SGK1 expression is down, basal effects of uh, ANP expression in the heart. So here we have a mimic of uh, uh, pathological cardiac uh, hypertrophy and knocking down SGK1 inhibits that process, telling us that SGK1 must be involved in the process both in vivo and in cultured cells. So we looked at SGK1 overexpression and showed uh, that in order for it to have that growth promoting effect in cardiac myocytes, it requires its kinase activity. So here we see cell area and ANP as a marker of cardiac hypertrophy. And when we overexpress SGK1 wild type here, you can see an increment in cell growth. And this is on top of cells treated with the growth agonist phenylephrine. Or we can transfect a constitutively active uh, SGK1 and see a little bit more growth even on top of that. But if the kinase dead form of SGK1 is transfected into the cells, you see that growth is completely inhibited. It's a dom dominant negative interfering effect. And here's the ANP mRNA, which is, uh, is uh, very much downregulated. So we wanted to see how and where SGK1 does its job in cardiac myocytes. And remember in renal epithelial cells, uh, it translocates to the ER uh, membrane from the cytosol uh, and that's where it's ubiquitated by HERD1, and that's where it, when it gets degraded. So SGK1 has this ER targeting sequence I told you about, which we have mapped and shown that it contains uh, several, about seven, ubiquitilation sites. So when we uh, transfect a flag tag version of wild type SGK1 into cardiac myocytes, we see that it uh, localizes in a perinuclear fashion which is where the ER is in this cell type. But if we make an altered form of SGK1 with the N-terminal 60 amino acids uh, deleted, which is where this ER targeting sequence uh, resides, you can see SGK1 goes all throughout the cell and it doesn't go to the ER where HERD1 is. And so we might predict that it's also not getting degraded very effectively which may be why there seems to be so much of it, and that's the green stain here uh, in the so-called delta-60 transfected cells. We also showed that when we remove those ubiquitilation sites from the ER targeting sequence, the SGK1 went to the ER, but was very inefficiently degraded. Now, if we look at uh, immunoblots of these same cell cultures to see, uh, look at SGK1 degradation rate, we can see in the wild type case, this is a, what's called a cyclohexamide chase experiment where we inhibit protein synthesis for various amounts of time and then measure SGK1 levels. 
and the speed with which the immunoblot goes down is a representation of SGK1 degradation in the cardiac myocytes. So pretty quickly degraded for wild type SGK1, but if we remove the ER targeting sequence, it's almost completely stable. Uh, also suggested by the uh, large uh, amount of staining uh, in these cell cultures here. So no ER targeting, no ubiquitilation, and slowly degraded is the uh, phenotype. And if we remove the lysine residues, it can still target to the ER, but it's not ubiquitilated and therefore it's not degraded as shown by uh, no change in the immunoreactive SGK1 in these cells. So we were pretty excited about this because so far it seemed like somehow this SGK1 and the cytosolic face of the ER in this E3 ubiquitin ligase, HERD1, were involved in growth of the cardiac myocytes. So we also wanted to find out uh, whether the chaperone gil -Z plays a role. Uh, so we uh, looked at knocking down gil -Z, and we found that this increases SGK1 de degradation, uh, just like our diagram here would predict. So here's SGK1 degradation uh, with gil -Z present, pretty rapid in this particular example, but you can see a lot less to start with and a lot more rapid degradation when we don't have the chaperone that's cloaking the ER targeting sequence. So we think that SGK1 and its localization to the ER and the regulation of that localization by this chaperone gil -Z are all involved in cardiac myocyte growth. So we wanted to look on the other side and see if we overexpress gil -Z, uh, does that decrease SGK1 degradation? So here's a few cases where uh, we took uh, cultured neonatal rat ventricular myocytes and used adenovirus to overexpress gil -Z, and then looked at SGK1 uh, immunoblotting uh, with several different uh, levels of adenovirus. And you can see with adeno control, there's not much SGK1 in the cells, but when we overexpress the chaperone, sure enough, the amount of SGK1 builds up tremendously. Uh, and here's overexpression of gil -Z here, uh, consistent with our hypothesis that this chaperone gil -Z is also critical for how uh, cardiac growth is regulated by SGK1. So uh, we took this a step further and uh, we wondered whether we could synthesize a peptide that here we call SGK1 peptide, uh, which would mimic part of the binding region between gil -Z and SGK1, and then ectopically express that peptide and see whether it disrupts this binding and therefore uh, sends SGK1 to the ER where it becomes degraded. This we would hope would be a therapeutic against uh, pathological cardiac hypertrophy, and that's why we took this approach. Our idea would be to show the proof of principle with a peptide uh, and then maybe develop an assay for the uh, search for maybe small molecules in our, in our screening library to see if uh, we have a small molecule that we can find that does the same job. So I won't go over this immunoprecip here, but let me show you in neonatal cardiac myocytes and culture, that the amount of ANF, ANP expressed when the cells are subjected to uh, phenylephrin goes way down when we include the SGK1 uh, peptide, which is about 30 amino acids in length. Uh, we did further experiments to prove the principle of how this SGK1 peptide works. And here we took adults mouse ventricular myocytes uh, where the peptide that had been FITSI labeled was injected into the animals and then the myocytes isolated uh, to show you that when we inject vehicle, we don't see any FITSI labeled myocytes, but when we inject mice with the peptide that's FITSI labeled and isolate myocytes, we can see lots of robust uh, fluorescence of the FITSI uh, labeled peptide. We can also look at these same myocytes, treat them with phenylephrine, and this is from uh, the adult mouse ventricular myocytes now, uh, and then watch their cell size over time. And as we increase the amount of peptide, the cell size goes down, consistent with the peptide being anti-hypertrophic. 
Uh, here's another example of that, uh, where we've included the peptide at different concentrations. And instead of cell size, we looked at the marker A and P, and you see when phenylephrine is added without peptide, the A and P in these adult uh, mouse myocytes is robustly increased. But as we increase the amount of peptide, then this inhibits phenylephrine-mediated uh, cardiac myocyte growth. Uh, so we continued experiments in this uh, along these lines to see if uh, Gilsey, uh, interrupting Gilsey binding to SGK1 also speeds up its degradation. So that's shown in the left-hand panel here where we did the cyclohexamide chase experiment and the speed with which um, as a function of time these bars go down is representation of the speed at which SGK1 is degraded. So you can see when we uh, provide the peptide to the cultured adult myocytes at one micromolar, it's very rapidly degraded over this time frame. Uh, and then finally, we wanted to find out whether that degradation was dependent on HERD1, that is to say, whether SGK1 was relocating to the ER when uh, the peptide was added and the binding of Gil Z to SGK1 was interrupted, and whether uh, HERD1 was required for that uh, de rapid degradation. So here we see um, uh, a cyclohex chase where we just do one time point one hour, and we can see SGK1 is degraded at a certain weight rate. When we add the peptide, that rate goes uh, uh, more quickly and uh, SGK1 degradation is uh, more robust. But then when we knock down HERD1, we can see SGK1 degradation is basically non-existent. And so uh, this degradation shown here is, is also HERD1 dependent, meaning it's happening at the ER. So we can look at other cell types and we chose fibroblasts and inflammatory cells here. Uh, and so in fibroblasts, we can look at TGF beta as an activator, uh, as a fibroblast uh, activator, and uh, show that they convert to myofibroblasts as far as alpha smooth muscle actin and uh, mRNA uh, expression is uh, shown. And when we add increasing amounts of peptide, this TGF beta stimulated conversion is decreased. And the reason we are interested in that is because it had been previously shown that SGK1 had an involvement with the uh, activation of cardiac fibroblasts. Uh, we also looked at whether uh, SGK1 uh, or the peptide inhibited uh, expression of periostin, which is required for cardiac fibroblast activation, and it does with a dose response. Uh, and then a, a third place that SGK1 is known to be involved is in inflammasome signaling. And so this would be in non-myocytes that are uh, inflammatory cells. And we showed that TGF beta can stimulate the production of IL-1B. Uh, that's a marker of inflammasome activation. And when um, we uh, act, increase the amount of the peptide that's added, we see inhibition of inflammasome activation. And again, these are all cells that were derived from uh, cardiac uh, uh, mouse um, hearts. So they're all cardiac in origin, but they're just the different cell types. So we could envision that if we gave this peptide to animals, not only would it moderate unwanted cardiac growth of cardiac myocytes, but it might also moderate uh, fibroblast activation, as well as inflamm inflammasome activation. And inflammasome depends on the timing, has been shown to be uh, damaging in the heart. So I just wanted to summarize what I've told you today uh, with our hypothesis of what we call regulated SGK1 degradation at the ER uh, and how it affects cardiac hypertrophy. So in the steady state under basal conditions, non-disease state, SGK1 is kept relatively low through the ubiquitination and uh, proteasome-mediated degradation process at the ER, uh, which involves this HERD1 ubiquitin ligase. However, uh, upon an R model system, it's pressure overload, 
we see an increase in the expression of gil -Z as well as SGK1. Uh, and by virtue of gil -Z, SGK1 is diverted away from the ER uh, and where it is not degraded. And then we've shown it participates uh, in cardiac hypertrophy. And I didn't have time to show you today, but that uh, is, uh, involves the activation of the mTOR, uh, mTOR pathway, and in particular, uh, TORC1, complex one is what we've studied. So uh, I hope you um, realize now that um, proteostasis involves protein degradation all over the cell, but in our case, we were looking at the cytosolic face of the ER, and that degradation there uh, can be involved in heart failure, so that we have degradation of ER and non-ER proteins by canonical versus non-canonical ERAD, all of which I talked to you today about is what we call non-canonical ERAD because it's a new role for ERAD uh, that we never knew in the heart that that existed. And so what we think is that maybe there are other proteins that are regulated in this non-canonical fashion, the same way SGK1 is, and maybe they don't even have to be misfolded and that this is a new, uh, a new function for the ER uh, and protein degradation in regulating the levels of signaling proteins like SGK1. So we are now doing uh, proteomics experiments to search for and hopefully find uh, some other proteins that are regulated the same way as SGK1 is in cardiac myocytes. So uh, I wanna show you the people who helped with all of this work, all shown here, uh, new people to the Translational Cardiovascular Research Center, uh, are Sharinda Rudgar and Tobias Jacobi, who are new assistant professors that we are so happy we just recruited to the center. Uh, most all the work that I showed you today was done by um, most everybody on this slide, but Eric Blackwood and Sharon Rudgar were the ringleaders in this whole study spanning many years. Uh, and Donna Tiroff, who was back in San Diego, uh, also helped with this work. We have collaborators on this and other studies from uh, all over. And uh, on this study, Tony Rosenzweig at Harvard and David Pierce at UCSF and Ken Margulies at Penn uh, helped collaborate with us on these studies. And uh, Gokhan Hadamizilgil is uh, also involved because uh, he made uh, the flocks version of the ATF6 mice that we used. And there's our, um, that was our first annual uh, Translational Cardiovascular Research Center, all center uh, photo uh, toward the um, vaccination time of COVID. Anyhow, I wished I could call it the end of COVID. Uh, but we're finally able to all get together uh, in one place for this photo a year, year and a half after we moved here. So we're uh, pretty excited about the center and uh, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about some of our most recent uh, research and uh, happy to entertain some questions if you have any. Well, that was fascinating. Um, we uh, heard about uh, a non-canonical uh, role uh, for proteostasis in controlling the, um, the, in regulating the levels of this protein SGK1. And um, you showed us uh, that uh, with uh, certain pathological states, uh, SGK1 uh, levels increase and contribute to the um, pathology and specifically the hypertrophy of the heart uh, seems to be affected uh, by SGK1. So, um, so normally, um, this, is, is, uh, this protein is kept at uh, levels that do not cause pathobiology. What's its normal role? What happens if, if, on the other hand, if you reduced SGK1 levels below the normal physiological levels, what would happen? So, like a lot of kinases, it has a lot of targets. And uh, some of those targets, if we go back to the renal epithelial cell biology, um, it's in those cell types, it's not so much involved with the growth of the cells as it is involved with the phosphorylation of the machinery that maintains the levels of the epithelial cell sodium channels uh, of what we want them to be to affect sodium reabsorption uh, and maintain it physiologically. 
Uh, so that's just one example that I showed that, that where it has different roles. And we don't actually know all the roles it has in the heart, but if we just stick with the uh, cardiac myocytes, uh, one of the things, and I know this is probably pretty obvious to everybody, but just to, to restate it in terms of this talk, is that most growth processes have an important basal role in any cell type, but certainly in cardiac myocytes. Keeping those cardiac myocytes the size they're supposed to be for, uh, as we call normal activity. Uh, and so whenever a stress comes along, and uh, the amount of, in this case, SGK1 uh, increases, um, then so does the growth. And so in a way, it's like a version of what it was all along anyhow, but just amplified by the increased uh, pathological gene expression. What we don't know in the case of SGK1 is what the other targets are in cardiac myocytes for its phosphorylation. But um, we know in one case uh, where I remember I told you that Tony Rosenzweig is one of our um, is one of our colleagues, uh, uh, collaborators here, is that uh, Tony has done some work on other things that SGK1 does in the heart. And it harkens back to the renal epithelial cells where SGK1 uh, targets include sodium and potassium channels in the heart. And what Tony showed is dysregulation of SGK1 uh, alters uh, rhythm. And in the mice where he had SGK1 overexpression, uh, he didn't do the deletion, but he did the overexpression. Uh, he showed an unwanted um, arrhythmogenesis in those animals. Uh, so I think that he was able to find at least some of those, couple of those channels that were uh, targets of SGK1. Uh, but beyond that, and activating the mTOR pathway, um, it would just be by analogy to say, uh, cancer cells or other cell types that we could begin to guess at, at the targets. Having said that, we're collaborating with uh, Jenny Van Eyck in uh, LA in Cedar, uh, at uh, Cedar sinai and um, we're doing the phosphoproteome in our SGK1 overexpressing and SGK1 uh, knockout mouse hearts. So it'll be interesting to find out uh, what we come up with there as far as targets are concerned. I don't know if that directly addresses your question, uh, John, but um, it's, I think it's kind of close. Yeah, no, that was, that was great. I have a follow-up uh, question on that. Um, the, um, I thought it was interesting that uh, SGK1 um, overexpression has been associated with arrhythmias. And I wonder if um, SGK1 could underlie uh, both the hypertrophy and the arrhythmias that occur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you, what do you think about that? I don't see any reason why not, because really what Tony Rosenzweig showed was um, he, he found that phenotype and that's what he pursued. And uh, um, he and I have been talking for many years about this, um, but he never, he, he didn't end up pursuing a hypertrophic phenotype. I'm not even sure if he observed it. I haven't talked to him in a long time about um, his observations, but I think it's very reasonable to posit that that's the case. The other thing, John, that I, I didn't really um, get a chance to talk about here is that uh, pretty much everything I showed today when it comes to myocytes were ventricular myocytes. Uh, however, we have a, a great interest in the atrial myocytes. And as you uh, know, the atrial myocytes have an endoplasmic reticulum that serves an additional role in the production, of course, of, uh, of peptides for secretion, endocrine peptides like atrial natriuretic peptide. And so we have done studies on the atrial myocytes to look at how much uh, they have in terms of the proteostasis machinery, like HERD1 and, and other proteins. And they are a special uh, cell, cell type because as we predicted, and you might guess, uh, they have uh, a huge amount of ER stress related machinery uh, because they have to be ready for uh, folding all of those peptides that they have to secrete. So having said that, um, we have begun to do some studies with SGK1 in atrial myocytes, and it'll be interesting if the arrhythmias are more evident there uh, than in the ventricular cells, but could be two different types of arrhythmogenesis depending on 
which cell type uh, this happens in. What, what we don't know, and we think it's going to be a fascinating thing to look into, is when we do TAC and therefore do left ventricular pressure overload, what happens to atrial myocyte SGK1 uh, proteostasis? So those, those things are still on the, on the edge uh, of what we're doing now. And one of the things that was just developed, we published it last year in circulation, is a way that we have of modulating or changing gene expression in atrial or ventricular myocytes independently of each other. So we can now uh, delete SGK1 in either all cardiac myocytes or one of the other type of cardiac myocyte and then look at the phenotype. So we're pretty excited about that. And we've that'll, got- That'll be very interesting to see. Telemetry, uh, you know, and look for arrhythmias. So. That'll be very interesting to see the results of that. I have uh, one other comment. And then I think Lily has a question that's just come in from the audience. So my, my comment is I was just at this uh, wonderful meeting in Göttingen, Göttingen Germany. Uh, it was a cardiovascular regeneration meeting. We talked a little bit about the um, xenografts. And you may know that one of the problems they have with the porcine xenografts uh, is that uh, porcine heart gets, continues to grow and gets too large uh, for the thoracic cavity. So they, they, uh, one of the things they have to do uh, is genetically modify the pigs to knock out the growth hormone receptor. But I, you know, maybe your peptide that you've developed, uh, the SGK uh, peptide antagonist, could be uh, useful in that situation. Um, as well as, you know, perhaps in other forms of cardiac hypertrophy. Yeah, so uh, I know I know about that meeting. Uh, and so I, I'm sure that was a pretty exciting uh, place to hear about that particular study that you, uh, you cited. Um, as far as uh, continues to grow, um, you know, we can't always be sure exactly why they continue to grow, uh, but... Um, using a, a pharmaceutical might be a little bit more adaptive than uh, doing uh, genetic uh, uh, changes sure, in you the better animal. control. And so uh, what I think is that um, there are inhibitors of SGK1, um, it's kinase activity. And uh, if it's the case that the kinase activity is involved in growth, I think that those inhibitors could be useful. Um, uh, those inhibitors, I think, are uh, do, do work uh, as antiarrhythmics, and as you might guess, being small molecule inhibitors, they go uh, all over every tissue and every cell type, and could have pleiotropic effects. So I'm, uh, they could be of high value in that experimental model. But we're thinking, uh, we you could even engineer, so we didn't approach this from inhibit the kinase, we approached this from inhibit, it changes location is what we approach this from. So that's what our peptide does is it, it actually changes its location, decreases its degradation, uh, and therefore increases its, uh, uh, not kinase activity, but the numbers of SGK1 molecules there are. So we have this suspicion that it's where SGK1 is in cells as much as how active it is that could be the special sauce or something that if we could regulate its localization uh, and many other kinases in a very sophisticated way, uh, maybe that would be more targeted uh, therapeutics to this particular phenomenon as well that you just mentioned. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions now, uh, Professor Glombotsky, but uh, thank you so much for telling us about that recent work and uh, really looking forward to seeing uh, this new novel uh, therapeutic avenue get developed by you and your colleagues there. Uh, keep up the great work. Thanks again for joining us tonight at the Cutting oh. Edge of Cardiovascular Sciences. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was great to talk to you. Good night now. Good night.